So what is a Christian part two? And, and, and we're not going to um, go right back to the beginning. But you would recall, I'll just give you the, the brief introduction. I, I, I mentioned um, a few things. I said, you're not a Christian because you're born into a Christian home. You're not a Christian because you're part of a Christian family. And you're not a Christian because uh, you go to church or you give to the finances of the church or you own a Bible or you sing a few songs. That doesn't make you a Christian. And so we went on to ask, if that doesn't make you a Christian, what is a Christian? And then we began to explain um, what is a Christian. We began to teach what is a Christian. We looked at a dictionary definition of a Christian and we progressed from there looking at Acts chapter 11. And then we, um, we progressed uh, to another portion of Scripture. Uh, away from our, our, our core Bible study text, we went to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4 to verse 10. So let's quickly read Acts chapter 11, and then we'll go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Uh, sorry, yeah, uh, chapter 1, verse 4 to verse 10. So we'll read Acts 11 first. Beginning at verse 19, this is the word of the Lord. So then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except to Jews alone. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. The news about them reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. Then when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And considerable numbers were brought to the Lord. And he left for Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for an entire year, they met the church and taught considerable numbers and the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch and we put a bookmark on that and we go to first Thessalonians beginning in chapter one Paul and Silvanus and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the presence of our God and Father, knowing, brethren, beloved by God, His choice of you, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction. Just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. Verse 6 says, You also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the work in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone forth. So that we have no need to say anything. For they themselves report about us what kind of a reception we had with you. And how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. That is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. This is the word of the Lord and the church said, Amen. I took you to 1 Thessalonians chapter, four, um, chapter 1 verse 4 to verse 10 because I wanted to bring to you one of the earliest pictures of what it means to be a Christian. I shared with you last week the importance or a brief understanding of the importance of 1 Thessalonians and said it's one of the oldest books in the New Testament. And some scholars have 
dated it approximately 50 to 51 AD, meaning that it was written only 18 years after Jesus' life and death. So it's one of the earliest pictures we have of the Christian church in the very beginning. And if we would read and study 1 Thessalonians and the, the, the believers at Thessalonica would come to realize, would come to see that they came to Christ from idol worshipping paganism. Paul's brief ministry here resulted in a small congregation made up of mostly converted Greeks along with a few believing Jews and some leading women of the town. We find evidence of that in, in, in Acts 17 verse 4. We'll cover that when we get to Acts 17, which seems like a f long way away in our study in the book of Acts. But 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 10 says, they turned to God from idols. Gives us a picture of who they were. So this passage tells us that these idol worshippers, this idol worshipping pagans became followers of Christ. And it offers to us, church, it offers to us the most basic street level, basic description of what it means to be a Christian. We learn from this text that uh, their transformation was so complete and so obvious that they turned from this idol-worshipping pagan life to Christ. It, their, their, their transformation was so obvious that in Acts 17, uh, uh, Paul is described together with his brother there. Paul and Silas are described as people who have turned the world upside down. Folks, church, beloved, what we see here is a picture of, of Christianity in its purest form, in its rawest form, stripped away from traditions of men and religious traditions. These were not people, as you read this, as you come to understand this text, these were not people who were borrowing ideas from the world around them. They were not borrowing philosophies from the culture around them. They were not merging themselves with other belief systems and other religious practices around them. No. Let us be clear. They were, they were Christians with a Christ message, and that message invaded and transformed the Roman Empire. When we go back, we go back to Acts 11, and we read in Acts 11, if you go and follow with me again in Acts 11, reading from verse 22, it says, The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exalted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And a great number of people were added to the Lord. Verse 25, so Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Now notice, notice when, when Barnabas went to fetch Paul and, and to bring him to Antioch. And we see that for an entire year, they were merging with the culture around them. They were adopting the philosophies of the people around them? Were they adopting the ideas of the world around them? No. It says for an entire year, they spent time together. They spent time with the ch church, teaching a great many people. Here is Barnabas. Here is Saul. These are believing men, converted men. These are men who are teaching the church. And not adopting the ways of the world. So people were being shaped and transformed by sound teaching. They were filled with truth. And let's be honest. Let's be real. Let's face it. Truth matters. God saved them. Put them into a church. And put men over them to teach them. To teach them what? To teach them about God. To teach them who they were 
in God. To teach them about God and to teach them who they were in God. Now who God was to them and who they were in God was manifested in their behavior. Was manifested in their actions, in their behavior, in the way they lived, in the decisions that they made. Beloved, we see they are noted, they are called followers of Christ. They are called Christians. All of that teaching pays off. That entire time that Paul, uh, Saul and Barnabas are spending with them is, has paid off. Why? Because people around them recognize, hey, you look like somebody we know and heard about. Oh yeah, you're followers of Christ. Your life represents Christ. Your life looks like Christ's life. Wow! Right believing always produces right living in Christ. Sound belief produces sound behavior. Sound doctrine produces sound duty. This is how it was in the beginning, church. This is what we see in this church here in 1 Thessalonians. This is the message that turned the world upside down and spread like wildfire. And, it, and that message and that life of the Christian there was threatening the power structures. Challenging the status quo, upsetting both the pagans and the hyper-religious alike. You know, sometimes you see the label on a bottle, maybe on a bottle of cleaner, or cleanser, or some kind of powerful detergent that says, do not use at full strength. Dilute with water first. Because the liquid is too strong in its raw form. In its undiluted form, it is too strong. In this passage, we see Christianity in its earliest undiluted form. And no wonder, no wonder, church, the Christians turned the world upside down in Acts 17, verse 6. So we're asking, what is a Christian? And we look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and um, verse 1 to verse 10. And I want to clearly take you to some places right now. Um, I want to show you, this is the first one. We covered this last week. And if, you, if you're hearing it again, that's wonderful. It's good. Repetition is good. So number one, what is a Christian? We're looking at First, Thess first Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4 to verse 10. What is a Christian? A Christian then is someone who is chosen by God. For verse 4 says, For we know, brothers loved by God, that He has, what? Chosen you. The key, the key phrase there, the key words there, as He, God, He, God, has done what? Has chosen you. And that speaks of the sovereign grace of God in salvation. Church, it would do you well, it would do us well to know and to confess that God has chosen you to be saved. If He had not chosen you, you would have never been saved at all. Sometimes people speak of finding the Lord, but if He had not found us first, we would never have found Him at all. Through these last few months, we've been teaching a very important Point, and that point is salvation begins with God and not with us. Salvation does not begin with our choice of Him, but His choice of us. He chooses us and then we believe. A Christian then is a person who has been called and chosen by God Himself. Being a Christian is not a work of merit or personal accomplishment, but an act of God's free grace we'll press on we'll press on we covered this last week if you're listening to this for the first time wonderful what is a christian a christian is someone who responds in submission and surrender to the gospel message look at verse 5 verse 5 says because our gospel came to you not only in word but also in power and in the holy spirit and with full conviction those words full conviction is what we're focusing on here in number two
This is how it works. This is how it works. God's election, God's choosing of us becomes effective in us through the preaching of the gospel. When the word is preached in the power of the Holy Spirit, it produces deep conviction in the hearts of the hearers. That is why full conviction, that is why full conviction matters so much. It means that people are so deeply convicted of their sin and the need of a Savior that they run to the cross, embrace Christ as their only hope and only forgiveness of sin, their only salvation. A Christian then is someone who, having been called and chosen by God, responds to the gospel message with full conviction and is saved. Are you with me so far? If I lost any of you, if I've lost you, I'll go back and start again. Number three, what is a Christian? A Christian is someone who regards, who regards Christ as infinitely more valuable than any earthly suffering. Look at verse 6. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. And last week I asked you to underline those words, in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. This third characteristic uh, uh, may surprise some people because it speaks of how the Thessalonians responded to the gospel message. In their particular situation, as you've heard me briefly give you the historical background in their particular situation, they faced enormous pressure, enormous cultural pressure. Why? Because they came from idol worship to Christianity. No doubt, no doubt they faced opposition from friends, family, people around them, probably from the temples they used to worship in. They probably still saw those people in the marketplace or met them over family meals and they faced tremendous, tremendous persecution and pressure. In those days, it wasn't popular to be a follower of Christ. But take note of the words, in much affliction. Those words literally mean to be pressed to the limit. In much affliction, some of your Bibles might say, in much tribulation. It means to be pressed to the limit. It has the idea of being under the thumb of another person. Feeling the pressure pushing down on you. Can you see that illustration? Can you imagine that? You're unable to move. You're unable to do anything because you're being pressed down from every angle. The Bible says they received the word with the joy of the Holy Spirit, even though they were pressed, even though they were pressed to the point of being crushed. They received the word with the joy of the Holy Spirit. So in this case, it means that the Thessalonians were so glad to be saved that they couldn't stop. Not even persecution could stop them. Wow. And we hear reports from Christians in the mission field. And we thank God for those reports because they're not only encouraging, but they're convicting. We hear reports of how in places like Haiti and and the hill tribes of India and places like the remote parts of China, in those places where being a Christian really costs something. And those converts, those who've made, uh, who be, who've been converted into Christianity, they show a deep joy in their conversion. Unlike what we see in the Western world. Unlike what we see in our churches in the United Kingdom. Unlike what we see in the churches in the Western world. Here we tend to take our blessings for granted. There, in those places of the world, every day is a gift from God. And every Sunday, church, every Sunday is like an oasis in the desert of suffering. Oh, I pray that you would learn even that last line of what I just said to you right now. Every Sunday is like an oasis in the desert of suffering. I love Sundays. Why? It's my oasis in the desert of suffering. Do 
joy of the Holy Spirit. He says they received it with joy. They received the word with joy. And we take a moment right now. We take a moment right now to even help. Help to reach out to those who are our friends and family in the Pentecostal charismatic word of faith churches and be able to say to them, hold on, the joy of the Holy Spirit is not jumping and dancing and falling all over the place and laughing and shouting around. That is not what is happening here when Paul talks about the joy of the Spirit or joy in the Spirit. It's amazing how even we were, we were part of that. We were part of that. Joy of the Holy Spirit means we come to church. We used to come to church and jump around here on a Sunday morning. And as soon as we leave, it, that joy seems to have left. How do we know that? Because the same people who are jumping on a Sunday morning, imagine this. If that is what joy means, and if you want to have joy every day, then you should be jumping around in the boardroom with your boss. Would you do that? No. There's your boss trying to have a conversation with you and you whoo and you're jumping around and whoo I got the joy of the Holy Ghost. He'll fire you. He'll not only fire you, he'll commit you. He'll section you. He'll call an ambulance to take you to hospital. So how is it only that joy only happens in the church setting? So then truly what Paul is talking about here, what the Bible talks about joy, what we see is this overflowing, this almost boiling over of God in the heart of every believer. And that boiling over, that overflow is taking place in every aspect of life. It takes place in the way they're greeting people. And it takes place in the way they're talking to people. It takes place in the way decisions are made. It takes place in the way they're talking with their husband and their wife. The way they're raising their children. That is the joy that was there. And they have that joy even whilst under pressure. Even whilst being pressed down. You know, Jesus never invites, <laughs> invites anyone to receive him on a trial basis. Although some try to do that. When... In some denominations, when, and we used to do that even in our previous denomination, try Jesus and see if he works for you. Why don't you give him a try? Just give him a try. Just, just give him a try. Oh no, I grew up as a Hindu. Give Jesus a try. Come back and talk to me after one week. Just give him a try. Jesus never invites us to receive him on a trial basis. In the words of one German philosopher, when Jesus calls a man, he bids him to come and die. That's what he says. When Jesus calls a man, he bids him to come and die. True conversion means that you continue to follow Christ even when the going gets tough. Even when the going gets rough, you follow Christ. What is a Christian? And a Christian is someone who joyfully submits to follow Christ no matter the cost. Number four. I hope you're getting something from this. For I'm certainly getting something from this. What is a Christian? Number four, a Christian is someone whose life has been genuinely changed by Jesus Christ. Look at verses 7 to 8. It says, you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere. So that even... We need not say anything. Key words there. You became an example. First word we're going to look at is the word example. In the Greek, that word is tupos, T-U-P-O-S, and it, it, it gives you the impression of, of, of a piece of metal pressed into a clay. And you know, when you pull that metal away, it leaves an imprint. It leaves an impression. There's a great lesson we can learn here. One of the ways, and I'm careful to say this, one of the ways that, that, that you can evangelize, one of the ways that you go about preaching the gospel is through your own changed life. In Mark chapter 5, we read the account of the man who was possessed by a legion of demons. 
Jesus had no problem in casting out the legion. But I want to draw your attention to what Jesus said to the formerly demonized man. Uh, the, the man who wanted to accompany Jesus on his travels. Jesus said to him, uh, go to your friends, go to your family and go tell them what the Lord has done for you. Let's look at that very quickly. We read it last week. We'll read it again today. Let's look at Mark chapter 5. Let us not skip over these important lessons. Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5 and we read from verse 1. Let us follow the word of the Lord. They came to the other side of the sea into the country of Gasserinus. Gerasenes, sorry. When he got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. And he had his dwelling among the tombs. And no one was able to bind him anymore. Even with a chain. Because he had often been bound with shackles and chains. And the chains had been torn apart by him. And the shackles broken in pieces. And no one was strong enough to subdue him. Constantly night and day he was screaming among the tombs. And in the mountains. Gashing himself with stones. Seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him and shouting with a loud voice, he said, What business do we have with each other, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God, do not torment me. For he had been saying to him, this is Jesus had been saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. For he was asking him, What is your name? And he said to him, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he began to employ him earnestly not to send them out of the country. And now there was a large herd of swine feeding nearby on the mountain. The demons implored him saying, send us into the swine so that we may enter them. Verse 30, and Jesus gave them permission. And coming out, the unclean spirits entered the swine and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea, about 2,000 of them. And they were drowned in the sea. Verse 14, their herdsmen ran away and reported it into the city and in the country. And the people came to see what it was that had happened. Let's look at verse 16. Those who had seen it described it to them how it had happened to the demon possessed man and, and, and all about the swine. Verse 17. And they began to implore him to leave their region. And as he was getting into the boat, let's look, look at verse 18. As he was getting into the boat, as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon possessed was imploring him, imploring Jesus that he might accompany him. But he did not let him. But he said to him, Go to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you. And how he had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in Decapolis what great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed. Beloved, following Christ involves telling people about Christ. Following Christ involves telling people about Christ. We all, you know, we all know this in, a, in the business sense that a, uh, a satisfied customer is always the best advertisement for any product. The best place you can make an impact for Christ is right where you are. Right where you are. You don't have to go overseas. You don't have to go away as a missionary. If God has called you to that, praise God. But right where you are, you can start living for Christ and showing others the difference He makes in your life, not just on a Sunday, but on a daily basis. Here's the second word we find in 1 Thessalonians. Let's go back there. The second word is sounded forth. Sounded forth. Fourth, verse 7 to verse 8, you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. And not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia, in Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. The second word that we said is sounded forth.
Once translated, it means this, folks. It means to strike the symbol. As the first Thessalonians, as these folks, these saved people who came from paganism to Christ, as they shared Christ with others on a daily basis, their message reverberated throughout the entire region. Wow. In the words of one commentator, and I quote, the first Thessalonians sounded forth reveille, and the whole province woke up, unquote. That word reveille is a bugle call, a trumpet call, or a pipe call, most often used in the military. And it is chiefly used in the military or amongst the military personnel at sunrise to, 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 to signal a wake-up call. It's a French word, to signal a wake-up call. Here then is the evidence, if you begin to look at what this commentator said, here then is the evidence of true Christianity, as it is clearly explained. First, you receive God's word gladly. Then you live it on a daily basis. And as you do, the message of the gospel reverberates in every direction. Those around you begin to sit up and they begin to take notice of it. Let's look at number five. What is a Christian? Maybe this point will narrow it down a little further. Look at verse 9 to verse 10. Verse 9 to verse 10 says, You turned to God from idols to serve the true and living God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. I want you to underline three words there. Firstly, the word turned. You turned to God from idols to serve. That's the second word. Underline that. To serve the true and living God or to serve the living and true God. And to wait, there's a third word, underline the word wait, to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Are you with me so far? Three words there, turned, serve, wait. Turned, serve, wait. Say it in your mind, they turned, serve, wait. Turned, serve, wait. Why is that important? If you pay attention to these three words, they describe to you, in that picture of the early church, what a Christian is. Number one, a Christian is one who turned. Number two, a Christian is one who serves. Number three, a Christian is one who waits. Shall we pause for a moment there? And I'll repeat that. We learn from this text that a Christian is, number one, a one who turned. Number two, he serves. And number three, he waits. There are three phases here, and they give us the three tenses of our Christian life. The past, the present, and the future. Are you following me right now? Shall I go a little slower? They give us three phases here right now of the Christian life. The past, the present, and the future. You turned. It's the past. You turned from your idols. You serve present. You serve the living God. And you wait Future tense, you wait for what? The coming of Christ, the second coming of Christ. That describes our Christian life. You, what did you do? You turned from your old life. You turned from idol worship. You turned from pagan worship. To do what? That's the past. To do what? To serve presently, to serve the true and living God. And to do what? To wait, future tense, to wait for the second coming of Christ. It's a Christian. Now again, we as Christians need to remind some of our folks, some of our friends, some of our brothers and sisters, maybe even you today here. We're not Christians who come to church and live our lives looking for a sign of who Christ is. We don't need God to do something today to show us a sign of who He is because we already have received the sign, which is the gospel message, which has fully convicted our hearts. We know who Christ is. So now we don't look for a sign of who Christ is, but we look for the coming of Christ. What is a Christian? A Christian is someone who has turned from his old life, 
to his new life in God. Serving the living God. He's waiting for Jesus' return. So what is a Christian? Are we Christians in the way that Bible describes Christians? Do people around us recognize that we are different from the rest of the world? We said it last week, we'll say it again this week. You covered it in your Bible study. They were called Christians at Antioch, not by those in the church, but by those outside the church. Remember what I said earlier on today and then last week? Hey, you remind us of somebody. You remind us of somebody. Oh yes, you remind us of Christ. Let us not be in that group of the Mahatma Gandhi follower type of people who said this. Mahatma Gandhi said this, I like your Christ, I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike Christ, unquote. That's what he said. Do people around us recognize that we are different to the rest of the world? Does our marriage, does our family, do our children, do our home, does the stewarding of our finances, the way we do our secular job, the way we shop, the way we talk, the way we interact with the world, does it show that we are followers of Christ, that we are indeed Christians. Oh, pastor, I'm a private Christian. I'm a private follower of Christ. I think that's a sermon all by itself. There's no such thing as a private Christian. There's no such thing as a private follower of Christ. It just does not fit together. The Bible's description of a Christian and a, someone who confesses that they're a private follower of Christ. Private meaning, I, I, I don't share it with anybody else at work. Nobody else needs to know. As long as I have this relationship with God, I'm a private Christian. There's no such thing as a private Christian. Here our text tells us that the world recognized who these people were. The world recognized there was something different about them. And the world called them Christian. A German philosopher once said this, and I quote, he said this, in truth there was only one Christian and he died on the cross, unquote. And when you think about that, isn't that so true? It's only one Christian. Christ himself. But here in the book of Acts, for the first time, we see, hold on, hold on. There's a bunch of people, there's a group of people whose life is so much like the one who died on the cross. Wow. Wow. Are we Christians in the way the Bible describes a Christian? Do the people around us recognize that we are different to the rest of the world? I repeat this as I did last week and I'll say it again this week. Does our marriage, our family, our children, our home, does it show that we are followers of Christ? As we head out of this place today, are we followers of Christ here? And we know the songs, but as soon as we step out of this world, we become people of the world. Is it just the stewarding of our finances, the way we do our circulate, our secular job, the way we shop, the way we talk, the way we interact with people, or the way we interact with the world, does it show that we are Christians, folks? That's a question to me and a question to you today. If as you reflect on your life today and you find that it is not in line with what the Bible calls a Christian, 
and you must act. You must come to God. And you must repent of your ways and you must seek God to help you to live as a Christian. And you must throw yourself at the mercy of God. And say, Lord, I'm a pathetic example. I live like a heathen. I live like a pagan. I throw myself at your mercy. And I ask that you would mold me and shape me. I ask that you would teach me on a daily basis. I ask that you would refine me. Make me a Christian. Take me to your word. Show me, teach me, guide me. Beloved, that you would throw yourself at the mercy of God. And ask God to help you. Let us pray.